Hello and welcome to Jeremy's Retro Bar. I'm Jeremy and this is my Retro Bar and it's not deja vu. We're back again with the Sharp MZ80C because I figured some things out. And so we're gonna actually take a look at it running today, but of course first, we're gonna need to make ourselves a drink. So I don't wanna waste a lot of time, so I'm just gonna be having whiskey on the rocks. So the whiskey that I'm having is Hibiki by Suntory. I'm gonna do a single ice cube and then as much whiskey as you like. That's it. Whiskey on the rocks. Cheers. Oh. It's a good whiskey. It's a really, 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 really good whiskey. Very smooth. I really, really, really like this stuff. So anyway, let's get to playing with this thing. So I know I'm back quickly. Uh, <laughs> I just was, just made a video and also I just made a video about this computer, but I wanted to do a follow-up so that it was a more complete look at this machine, the uh, Sharp MZ80C uh, from Japan. So I was able to get it working and uh, thank you very much to uh, YouTube commenter Tim Mooney who suggested that I take a look at how the audio tracks are playing back on the tape adapter. So the way that, uh, since I've never used a tape deck ever and um and i know that they can be finicky and i haven't ever had to use one with a computer before um and you can see right now i have a uh, sharp basic loaded up which would have been the one that came with the machine and it's basically something kind of weird with the way that the tape adapter works and so uh there's the the software you can download from a bunch of different sites and I, i'll put links in the description um, and they are um, usually used in emulators. They're called MZF files. And there's a converter you can get for DOS that will convert it over to a WAV file. And then that WAV file is what you play back. And so what I had done in the previous episode is I had just put it into my iPhone, plugged it into a tape adapter and was playing it back from my iPhone. Now, the WAV file that it creates is a, a pretty low resolution um, mono file. But for some reason, when the mono file plays back over the tape adapter, the tape adapter is, is of course made to be stereo, um, and kind of something weird happens. And so, um, what I was playing, what I played with is uh, played with different volumes. Um, I uh, and then I what ultimately ended up working was if I take those wave files and play them back using this tape adapter, I have to pan them hard right. So that just make, makes it so all of the audio is coming out of the right channel and not, none out of the left channel at all. And again, even though it's a mono file, it should be equal on both. For whatever reason, that's what works. So uh, instead of using the iPhone um, to load software in, I'm using my uh, MacBook Pro here uh, and I have Audacity open because Audacity allows me to open those files and to pan them very easily. Um, I tried it in GarageBand and GarageBand doesn't like the low resolution of the files that the uh, MZF to WAV uh, program in DOS uh, spits out. Um, and I know you can uh, convert it, uh, you know, to, to make it work in something like GarageBand, but Audacity is free, um, open source. So it's uh, nice and easy and anybody can get it. So uh, anyway, so with all of that out of the way, um, oh, I also had a couple corrections that I wanted to state. So um, one of them was that um, in my little history of it, I said that it was a Z80 running at four megahertz. And that's because that's what old-computers.com had stated was the processor speed. Um, but everywhere I looked and, and I got emails and comments about it, uh, that it, it runs at two megahertz. It's the exact same, basically the exact same hardware as the MZ80K. The only difference is that it came pre-assembled, it came automatically with 48K of RAM, and it had the, the cool red color on the, uh, on the monitor. So effectively, if you're looking for software or anything, or even documentation on the computer, the, the MZ80K is hardware identical. So um, it's just been fully maxed out. Um, the other thing is, I had thought that these two IC slots that were soldered with uh, just these little bridges across them, uh, which were CS1 and CS2, I thought maybe they were part of the problem, part of the reason why it wasn't working. Uh, it turns out that that is actually how you configured how much RAM the machine had in it. That's how it knew that it had 48K versus 
24K or something like that. Um, and so you, you, there's actually a manual online that says kind of which ones, which pins need to be soldered together in order for it to recognize all 48K. So anyway, mystery solved, mystery solved, <laughs> fact corrected. Um, so yeah, so pretty much the rest of the episode is just gonna be me taking a look at software. So uh, anyway, uh, and if you wanna go back and see the history and everything else that I did, go back and uh, check out that other video, but uh, I'm just gonna get to using the machine because that's the part that we were missing out of the last episode. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is show you how uh, to load the software into it and what that looks like. So on the left here, I have my MacBook Pro running Audacity, and you can see up here, I've just gone here and panned it hard right. And I'm just gonna show, uh, this is called basic 3K. I do in this one because it's the shortest uh, application so I can show the whole load time and not waste everybody else's time uh, on this video. So um, just like on the last video, we're gonna type load and hit return. And then it's gonna tell us to hit play on our tape deck. So we hit play on the tape deck and then I'm gonna hit play over here on Audacity. And uh, I had heard that the tapes uh, about halfway through will repeat the program. Well, the MZF files do not do that, so the converted WAV files don't do that. You have to go all the way to the end for the whole application to load in. So you can see the playhead maybe, and uh, once it hits the end, then we can see here on our MZ80C that it has loaded, that we now have 3K basic loaded into our computer. And so uh, just do our basic, uh, ten print, uh, do, 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 or is there? course, go to 10 and run. Ah, <laughs> uh, so satisfied. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get to some uh, applications. So I thought it was only appropriate that the first game that we try to launch here is Space Invaders or Space Invader. I love how <laughs> 70s this is. I love its green screeniness. I love, I'm actually pretty impressed with the animation that they decided to put it in this. I'm used to only uh, IBM software from this era. And let's see here. Uh, okay. So C moves me that way. Z, S, does S shoot? Nope, does period shoot? Yes, period shoots, okay. So even though there's no graphics mode really to speak of, it uh, it's still very playable for this sort of game. Ah.
<laughs> that was pretty good. So this game I'm going to load up is Defender, um, which was one of my favorite games on my original IBM PC. Um, sure what quite all of these are. I love this uh, animation. Uh, I think this is sevens up, ones down, six is fire probably? Enter might be stop. I'll just see what we get. Seven's up, one's down, oh, and... <laughs> I love how the spaceship is made out of uh, just these characters and I can't go back and forth. Oh, oh, it can, oh, it can, okay, hold on. <laughs> Controls are a little weird, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> that one's going to take a little while to get used to with the controls, but it uh, gives you an idea of kind of what Defender looks like on the, uh, on the Sharp MZ ADC. All right, let's take a look at something else. All right, so uh, here we're going to go ahead and try uh, Breakout, and uh, hopefully we can figure out uh, how to make this guy work. So press any key. Okay. Okay, space goes to the right. How do we go to the left? Shift space. Oh, Z. Oh, okay. Oh, it seems anything on the right goes to the right and anything on the left goes to the left. Oh, okay. I wonder if that noise is programmed in or like with the action, like if it needs to do that, or if that's actually noise on the circuit that needs to be cleaned. Because only when I hit a key. No, no it's not. It's happening even when I'm not hitting a key. Oh yeah, that's what you want. go. Oh, 
Ah, didn't go fast enough. How do you get out of that? Is there a way to get out of this? Ah, oh, there we go. Ah, uh, not bad. Well, I guess that about does it for the Sharp MZ80C. Um, I really love this machine. Um, I, I, I think I just love it for all its limitations, but also like kind of the extra mile that they seem to go in programming the software. Um, I know one of the things that I had read was that it uh, kind of became popular for early games because it had all that extra space. You could write bigger games for it. So you could use more of the RAM to, to build bigger and better games. It's, uh, I don't know, there's something really charming about it. I really, I really enjoy it. It's really a fun, fun machine. Uh, I'm glad that uh, I figured out how to make it work and hopefully if someone else is having issues, they come across this video and also figure out how to make theirs work, which would be great because um, there's not a lot of information out, uh, out about these, uh, especially in, in, in the West. I think there's a lot more stuff in Japan. Um, I think they, uh, you know, there's probably more of a community there, obviously, because it was a computer from there. Anyway, um, oh, um, one of the things I also did want to say is, um, so one of the weird kind of design quirks with this is that inside the, the case is where the reset button is. Um, which uh, I saw some like soldering directions. People have like put reset buttons on the back or the side or, or, or things like that. That seemed to be one of the, the common mods that people would do with this machine because opening this up every time you want to reset it and then hitting this button right here to reset um, just, uh, you know, isn't the most user friendly. Um, but I, I just love how it's all in like this one package. Um, I haven't played with the Commodore Pet, um, so I can't really say, but at this point, uh, I think this is uh, really awesome and I uh, I would almost say it might be better, but I don't know because uh, I haven't used one. So um, Pet could be very well leaps and bounds better than this guy, but uh, design-wise, I really love the look of these computers. Really gorgeous. Sharp, obviously, was really good at designing good-looking computers. Uh, you know, the X68000, for example, looked so much better than what anybody else was doing at the time. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Thanks for subscribing, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.